Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so without further ado, let's go to our first conversation with the first topic on the program, which is how new technologies can bring together governance and leadership around Africa, and indeed the world. We'll have two panels of speakers discussing this topic, and up first, on my immediate left, is Mr. Aeneas Chuma, a Zimbabwean macroeconomist who has been United Nations Resident Coordinator and the UNDP Resident Representative to Kenya since 2008. Next to Enes is Daudi Were, the project manager of Ushahidi, a site set up during the 2008 post-election violence to map incidents of violence based on reports submitted by Kenyans everywhere via the web or their mobile phones. It's now a platform that has been used in election monitoring and crisis response all over the world. Emmanuel Jal grew up fighting in South Sudan's war as a child soldier, then lived in Kenya as a refugee, and is today an internationally acclaimed recording artist who has performed with the likes of Alicia Keys and Moby and launched a global campaign called We Want Peace with supporters like George Clooney and Kofi Annan. Julie Gishuru is Citizen Television's digital manager, a popular talk show host and news anchor known and loved by many in Kenya, and in the little spare time that she has is a mother to five children. Julie is going to start off our conversation. Just great. It's really an honor to be here. And I think just getting straight into the conversation, the use of new media and digital technologies, we've seen it happen in the north of uh, the African continent. It's happening across the globe. Perhaps I'll start with you, Aeneas, and give us um, some of the trends that you are seeing globally. How are people impacting on the levels of leadership and governance in their countries using these technologies? Oh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Julie. I, I think to we can mention maybe two or three levels at which uh, the impact has been felt. I think the first is to try and broaden uh, participation in the democratic process. I think you mentioned uh, what happened in the Arab world, uh, and it was precisely because there was a, cap a capacity to mobilize and rally a lot of young people through social media um, uh, around the issues at stake. Uh, in Egypt, in Tunisia, and in other countries as well. Um, I think that's extremely important. So the value has been to create opportunities to uh, increase participation um, in democratic processes. Uh, you do see political parties now, even in Kenya, political leaders, uh, trying to reach as many people as possible through Twitter and Facebook and other media. But it's not just a matter of a one-way message. It's also a tremendous opportunity uh, for interaction and interactive conversation in that respect. And let me just mention also, I think, uh, particularly in a country like Kenya, where 70% of the population is very young, it's extremely important because it has brought into the debate young people uh, in large numbers because they're savvy uh, with the instruments of social media. And I think for, perhaps for Kenya as well, one of the most exciting is the capacity to improve uh, service delivery. If you look at the M-Pesa platform, uh, the payment of utility bills uh, through uh, the mobile transfer, but more important recently um, introduced by the Chief Justice, the capacity to settle, uh, say, fines through uh, the media. So this will improve uh, social media, uh, sorry, it will improve uh, service delivery and going forward. So I think the impact is uh, tremendous. Uh, it's not fully realized, and I think it will increase the capacity and interaction between leaders uh, in the democratic process. Well, thanks so much. You know, uh, we remember, we all remember, if we are Kenyans, 2007, 2008, and the post-election violence that hit us. And for me, I, I found Ushahidi, actually. Someone told me, you need to go and take a look at this website. How many of you ha have seen Ushahidi or know of it? A f quite, a, quite a few people here. Daudi Were, can we give him a hand for such an amazing, for you and your whole team? Tell us a little bit about the impact that you are and now it's not just Kenya or Africa, it's globally. Well, thank you. I think um, it's important to take a step back and realize that, you know, in the traditional African context, and indeed in many of the societies around the world, decision-making between um, leaders and their citizens was always done through discussion, through consensus building for a social good, if you like. 
at Ushahidi, we build technology tools that allow us to help start restart those discussions between citizens and their leaders, be they political, economic, um, social leaders. And um, you know, for the first time in, in this generation, we have a bi-directional communication advice in the hands of over 90% of the people, including the very poorest, the mobile phone. But when you look around a room like this, you understand Africa's unique innovation challenge where we have you know, iPads, very fast laptops, and I think there was someone even showing off an iPhone 5 <laughs> earlier on today. So um, you, know, you have to innovate and create tools for you know, our brothers and sisters who have access to only the most basic of technology, but your technology also has to work on the highest end of devices. Um, at Ushahidi, we've um, seen a lot of interest in our tools. Again, all about connecting citizens to their leaders. It's been um, used in 156 countries. Over 25,000 deployments have been translated into 32 different languages. But essentially, at, at the end of the day, it's because it's a communication tool that allows us to get back to our roots, restarting that discussion between citizens and their leaders. Uh, Emmanuel, you know, coming to you, what, what can I say? You are the very representation of the potential of the African continent, you know, coming from being a child soldier to doing so much, working on peace, being an artist, um, celebrating people, celebrate your music. You know, Emmanuel, tell us <coughs> briefly about your journey um, and the use of, your, of, of technology in terms of influencing people to understand that there is hope and we can. Uh, create peaceful environments with development and growth? Well, for social media has made it possible for people like us to keep on communicating and passing our message out. If you look at it, the internet has made the world look like a small village. It made it small, smaller. So mostly, I did not know how to use it, but when I started putting on, I realized people were following me up. So it became like where did, a Where did you start? Which platform? I started with MySpace, and then I was introduced to Facebook, and then somebody told me there's something called Twitter. <laughs> and if we talk about it, uh, We Won't Peace campaign, the one I did actually became uh, viral online because of the social media. And then later on, the media began to follow. Even just recently, I was in South Sudan, and I was beaten by the police, and I blacked out. So what happened is somebody else noticed I was being beaten and started talking about it on Facebook. And by the time I got home, it became viral all over the world. It's being pu published, and I had to write a statement. So social media, is, it's something that is a security for everybody. In some countries, they, have, they shut them down. Let me ask you, Emmanuel, as a result of that, what happened? Because the voice, people knew your voice was out there saying, this is what happened to me, what next? In terms of the police and the action they had taken on you. If you look at it in terms of it, I've been able even to raise funds for my charity. There's a challenge called Lose to Win, where I ate one meal a day for 362 days. I thought I was famous enough that I'll raise the money within one month, but I was humbled. But the good thing is, uh, <laughs> but the good thing is, People followed me on the social media, people giving up a cup of tea for 30 days, some people giving up uh, the bread, and they calculate the value and they post it. So in the end of the days, I managed to raise around 220 something thousand dollars that we used to refurbish two schools in South Sudan. That's amazing, and he's not saying it, but the police have, uh, there is action being taken on his beating last week, and uh, it's in court at the moment, is it? No, I just decided to leave it because I wanted to focus on the positiveness. We had a peace concert, yeah. which was happening, and we had a business gala, but after I flew to Kenya, later on, I got an email that two police has come to write a statement that they were witnesses, and my phone was found. So I lost my phone in the beating. Right. Two of the policemen, after having denied that they beat him, came forward and said, actually, we did. Um, and, and raising all those funds, that's absolutely amazing. And it takes me back to <coughs> the drought in the Horn of Africa last year. So many people dying. Uh, we were burying babies, women, children, walking across uh, from Somalia. 
um, in Kenya, and we raised, was it $10 million in a month uh, through the Kenyans for Kenya campaign, which for me, I think to date, is the most incredible representation of the potential of new media to harness and bring people together. And it was, of course, M-Pesa, where a lot of the money was being sent and all other mobile uh, money transfer uh, systems. So that, for me, was absolutely amazing. But ladies and gentlemen, there's a downside to everything, right? <laughs> so let's talk about that. Uh, Ines, let's talk about negativity, inciting people to violence, being hateful, malicious. Um, <coughs> how do you contain these things on these platforms? Well, I think the tremendous advantage is really quite positive in terms of the capacity to link people, to interact, uh, to debate, and to question leadership, um, and also to improve uh, service delivery. But yes, we have seen a tendency now in some cases, and I'm glad to say it's a minority, towards um, hate speech through social media. Um, we're dealing with it even in Kenya as we prepare for the next elections through the NCIC. Um, I, I think that's one of the risks of this type of um, technology and uh, the stage at which it is at in terms of its evolution. Uh, but I think in, in time there will be instruments, um, first and foremost, to educate people so that it's an instrument that is used for good and for more promoting social goods as it, as it were. But technically, also, I think there will be um, instruments to limit, um, of, you know, overtly abusive use of the facility. I mean, you still get it even in the telephone, uh, even in books, you know. So the risk is there. But I think the tremendous positive, good, and potential uh, that social media and the digital era has brought, I think, is uh, cannot be underplayed. Uh, so Dowdy, you know, Ines is telling us, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a minority, it's a clear minority, mm -hmm. and then there's lots of good happening, but it, it can have its toll, even mm -hmm. this minority. Mm -hmm. So from your perspective, what can be done to address mm -hmm. this issue? Yeah, just to emphasize again, it is a very small minority. The, the positive <coughs> impact of the web, the internet um, on Africa far outweighs the negative stories, and at Rishaidi, we really believe in a free and open internet. Mm -hmm. What can we do about it? I always say that we need to, you know, improve or rather help um, everyone become more intelligent consumers of media. You know, if, if you're not as easily influenced, then the message itself is largely irrelevant. So just as we say, you know, you know, don't believe everything you read in the papers, don't believe everything you see on TV, my strategy would be to reach out and you know, help our society become more intelligent consumers of media, wherever that media is, whether it's online or offline. Because once you reduce the level of influence that a hateful message has, then you've basically nipped it in the bud. Okay, and from a personal point of view, how do you deal with it, Emmanuel? I mean, you're giving out a message of peace, uh, of tolerance, of you know, saying, you know, let's all live together, and yet you have societies where people are ethnically uh, divided, there's a lot of suspicion, and you know, we've said it's hate speech, and in a lot of instances uh, where the negativity is, there is hate. How do, you, how do you combat that? Well, what I came to conclusion is once you start something and you have an influence and you have an impact in people's lives, then your life is no longer your own. So people, you become like public property. Everybody will say whatever they like, but if in the midst of controversy, what you have to say is what will measure your strengths and your truthfulness will be how you persevere and remain true to yourself. Because sometimes, uh, you know, I get people working with me and they all gang out and they become a group and they just attack me and put me in the corner. And so I have to wait, think if I have nothing to say, and then I have to wait for probably a week and then I'll probably get something wise to say and they all become my friends again. So. <laughs> It depends on how you handle it because what social media people are, it's like they own you. It's, it's different, you have some crazy fans and then you have serious haters. But I like the haters because they see things, your problems that you can't see and you should take them as a, a, as a challenge. Otherwise, if they're lying or they're saying the truth, they should be there. You take them as a challenge to strengthen you to move better. 
Well, those are words of wisdom right there. Um, I think another issue for me, and this, you know, right now we're heading into an election, and, and as a media personality, you know, you start to see the divides again, because everyone's talking, everyone gets, and it's so interesting, um, ladies and gentlemen, how people get suspicious towards elections. All of a sudden, everything that happens, <clears throat> there's a huge conspiracy theory behind it, and I think this starts to feed the tension around elections. And you know, you almost want to tell everybody, you know, calm down, calm down. And I, I'd really like to know, Ines, you know, what your thoughts are in terms of how this will, election will go, especially in, in view of the fact that a lot of young people are now starting to, of course, not the majority yet, but we have a lot of young people starting to get information on these platforms. Well, I think what we've done is to, on several fronts, one is to create with the government of Kenya a program on civic education um, is also being disseminated through social media, through Facebook uh, and Twitter. And what it does is that it provides information, but it also it provides a platform for discussion of issues, especially among young people. So it has brought a lot of young people into the debate, into the democratic process, as it were. Um, and then the second point is we try and use instruments uh, and platforms uh, like created through Shahidi to monitor what is happening, um, to monitor, for example, what is happening in Tana through crowdsourcing. Mm -hmm. You know, that's quite possible. And uh, I think one of the problems in, 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 in the Tana River Delta, the tragedies, is that uh, we knew that it was happening uh, because we had early warning systems uh, through some of the instruments that we've created. Uh, the problems that we didn't have early action to respond to it. And that's a matter we're discussing this morning, the Electoral Commission, on how this can be. That it can be built up. So there's tremendous um, opportunity to bring as many young people that historically may have been cynical around the electoral processes into the debate uh, to try and influence the discussion, try and hold leaders to account through their own websites um, going forward. So I remain very positive about it. There will be elements of negativity. I think that's inevitable. Mm -hmm. But as mentioned uh, by Daoud, it's a very small proportion. I don't think we should overly occupy ourselves with that. I think we should just focus on the social good and the tremendous potential that the platform offers. And just to emphasize how important those systems are, right through to the grassroots, right. during the referendum, um, we had that wa early warning system, an SMS platform in place, so it was affordable. It was, In fact, that line yes. was free. Mm -hmm. And if anybody yes, was, was worried about something happening, had noticed something, they could SMS and say, in this ward or th this constituency, this ward, you know, right. this is happening. And actually, I think between uh, uh, the Office of the President, the NCIC, right. and the UN, and yes. coming together that we're able to address and stop some. Thank you so much. I think our time is Sorry, up. I wrote this timekeeper, I have to bring this discussion to a stop. There are many to come, but that's a brilliant start, Thank and I think you. our audience agrees. Thank you, Thank you very much. <laughs>